everyone. We'll get started because I think we have a very packed program. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have you all here tonight to hear Glenn Phillips, the curator and head of modern and contemporary collections at the Getty Research Institute, and Melissa Huddleston, assistant conservator at the GRI, and they will talk about the process of reconstructing grandfather, a pioneer like us, the grandfather show as we call it for short, um, is a truly Herculean endeavor. Uh, Glenn has worked on it for seven years. I'm not sure if Melissa has worked on it for seven years as well. Um, so there are many different chapters to the story and it's really wonderful to have Glenn and Melissa here to give you the backstage uh, tour of this project. First, a little biography. Before his tenure at the GRI, Glenn was assistant curator for special projects at the Whitney Museum of American Art, where he worked on three Whitney biennials and the monumental Whitney exhibition titled The American Century, Art and Culture, 1900 to 2000. At the Getty, Glenn was part of the core organizational team for two Pacific St Standard Time projects, the 2011 project, LA, Art in LA, 1945 to 80, and the second PST LA LA that took place just a year ago. Melissa Huddleston is an artist. She lives and works here in Los Angeles. She was born and raised in Elm Springs, Arkansas studied painting at Western Washington University, and Melissa is a member of the board at Los Angeles Contemporary Archive. So I had the great pleasure of getting to know Glenn and Melissa over the course of the many weeks that they were here installing the grandfather show. And I can say without reservation that they have taken every care and have been so devoted to getting every object from the Harold Zeman archive perfectly selected and restored and installed and um, secured. And so you are here in for a great treat in hearing them talk about what it took to make this show a reality. So Glenn and Melissa. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Can you can you hear me? A, a little a look like this. <laughs> can we raise it up a little bit? Yeah. Um, so we 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 are going to try to cover a lot of ground tonight, and we're going to move quickly um, because this is a massive project. The the grandfather exhibition has more than twelve hundred objects in it. Um, most of those objects um, are in the Getty collections at the Research Institute. There's also a pretty large collection um, that is in a private collection in Switzerland uh, of a few hundred objects that were lent for the show. Uh, and so that, that gets us to the bulk of it, but there were still over a hundred objects that were missing. Uh, and some of those were very large objects, like for instance, some of the furniture. Uh, and so we made a decision in doing this show to, to actually try to make it complete, even with the missing objects. Um, so some of the things you see in the show are props, uh, not real. Either, in some cases, they're an exact, um, uh, they are the exact item, just not Etienne Zeman's version of it, but the same print uh, now for sale on eBay or Etsy. Uh, in other cases, we made substitutions, uh, and then in some cases, we sort of conjured things from thin air. We, we made, we sort of fabricated things. Um, on the other hand, all these objects, uh, you know, have had a hard life, and uh, they were, many of them uh, were damaged, um, 
at the time they were shown originally, I mean, they you know, had gotten water damage in 1930 or, or whenever. Um, but then in the time after the grandfather exhibition, some of them had, had uh, received later damage. And so Melissa's gonna talk tonight about this massive conservation effort uh, to restore the objects, not back to their original condition, but to the condition of when they were exhibited in 1974. Uh, so sort of selected conservation. So on the one hand, we're making a lot of the objects look a little younger. On the other hand, we're making brand new things that we're having to make look older. And one of the biggest challenges in the show is getting that to meet in the middle, uh, because we want it to be seamless. Uh, you don't want the missing objects to stand out. You don't want something to look overcleaned uh, or too fake as a prop, uh, because so much of this show is about ambiance in a way. Uh, so that's so we're we're talking kind of about production logistics tonight, and we're going to run through some of that. Uh, just to start briefly, this is uh, the the Fabrica Zeman's office and archive, uh, the sort of factory, a former watch factory in Switzerland where he lived. And I just want to quickly show you. This is what the archive looked like. Uh, this is how things were stored. Uh, it was in about 30,000 square feet of space, sort of multiple rooms. Uh, and all, of this, all of this material is now at the Getty. Uh, and the grandfather objects were basically mixed in here. Um, in some cases, uh, they were sort of on display. So here, you know, mixed in with a lot of other photographs are you know, kind of the photographs of Etienne that we see in the show. Um, here, sort of, I don't know that this laser pointer is gonna work. Like here, you know, we have the banner that was in the exhibition, sort of on display. Uh, the hairdresser banner, of course, that you've probably all seen inside. Uh, things like the, the scale here uh, that was on display on the writing table. So some of these things were just sort of out uh, in the fabrica, the hats that were in the wardrobe. Uh, this is how the furniture uh, was stored in a horse stable across the street from the fabrica. So this is how we found that. Um, some of the mannequin heads. This, this one, so the one on the left is one of these two here. The one on the right is actually the head that has the, the white wig and sailboat woven into it. And so we'll talk about that big effort a little later. Um, we, another thing we're doing tonight is acknowledging a lot of the work of other people that have really tremendously contributed to this. And one of those that I felt so fortunate about is um, a scholar, Mariana Roqueta Teixeira, who had done a thesis about the grandfather show. And she had done the work of sorting through the photographs and figuring out which went on which wall. Uh, so she had gone to the city of Bern and gotten the floor plan of the apartment and sort of mapped out what went where. Uh, that was so helpful for us. Uh, this is the original apartment. This is, this is basically what is constructed here, uh, the portions of the show, uh, the portions of the apartment that were used for the exhibition. Uh, and so then a lot, of, a lot of our work was sort of looking at these photographs and then sort of mapping, uh, you know, identifying each object and then finding it in the archive. Not always easy because he didn't store all the grandfather things in one place. A lot of this work was done by Audrey Young um, on her team at the Research Institute. Uh, and just going through you know, every wall and kind of mapping things out. And then looking at the floor plan and thinking about, okay, how do those things fit together? So for instance, um, those two walls I just showed you, here's the one with the trunk on it, here. And then that washroom is right around the corner, here. Um, and so they join, they turn a corner. Uh, and you can see, for instance, uh, like looking above the doorway there, that's a section of the show that says Grossmutter. That's, that's a little section about the grandmother. And then when you look around the corner in the washroom, you can see uh, that's more grandmother going around. Uh, but we didn't have that corner photographed. Um, and so, you know, some parts of the show are speculative, but you can pretty much know it had to be photographs of the grandmother continuing around. And this happens to be every additional photograph of the grandmother we have uh, just happened to fit. So we don't know that he showed them just quite like this. And in fact, I speculate that there may be some missing because I don't think Zaman would have put things in a straight line quite like this. Um, but that's all we got. I mean, that's what we have, it fit. 
that's what we did. Uh, in other cases, you know, the, the show was very well photographed, and particularly once we scanned the negatives, uh, there were dozens of negatives that had never been printed. Uh, but a lot of walls were photographed only once, and so it starts out looking like, okay, we can, we can do this easily, but then we just have this one photograph, and you get to the end, um, you start zooming. What is that thing? What is that? Uh, and so over and over again, uh, we're, we're, we're sort of pattern matching and shape matching, and surprisingly, we, we matched almost everything, uh, even from these crazy little blurs. Um, but that doesn't happen all at once. It might be, I, I maybe would have been working on a blur for six months and then suddenly it comes to you or suddenly you see it, suddenly you figure it out. Uh, and then there are the things not photographed. So this photograph here is the only photograph in the world showing what was on this section of the shelf. Uh, what was that? This is all we had. It happened to be enough. Uh, we actually, from those fragments, were able to kind of figure out the things that were missing and then actually locate them uh, and put them in the show. Uh, in other cases, a lot of the process was really about not thinking about what the photograph is supposed to be about, but what it captured by accident. Uh, so here, this photograph is the only clear image we have of this section here so that we could see that in addition to this circle of um, items that we could see, you know, blurry in other images, but there was also three hairpins there, there was like a wad of hair uh, that was down there, and then we were able to find those things too. Uh, the hairpins were still pulled out of their holders, so uh, we could find the exact ones. Um, you've maybe seen the color footage of the grandfather show that we have on display in this show. We did not find that footage until right before Thanksgiving. Um, and it wasn't in the, the archive at the Getty. Our documentary filmmaker, Reto Kadif, happened to be working in the Swiss television archives trying to find other footage, and he found this footage. So we didn't know until, this, until November that the carpet was green. Um, this footage here, this four and a half seconds of footage, was just gold for us to go through frame by frame and kind of catch what was on these shelves. So just to give you one example of kind of blur pattern matching. We didn't have an image of this shelf. We'd never seen what was here. What is that? <laughs> we found it. Um, it actually happened to be something not in the Getty collection. It was in the private uh, collection. and. Uh, we only figured this one out four days before the opening. We got it FedExed from Switzerland, so we were able to include it. Um, so now I'm going to turn over to Melissa, and she's going to talk about uh, the kind of conservation side of the research. Thank you. Okay, so the next set of images are showing what the objects looked like when they arrived at the GRI. Um, it sort of felt like an avalanche of objects were kind of rolling into the lab and um, I remember very clearly the day that this box arrived and I thought, what is this? <laughs> I, I, I thought, wow, this must be some really exciting uh, installation artist whose archive we've gotten. And so I called Glenn down to the lab and, and said, you know, can you, can you shed a little light on this for me? I'm not really exactly sure how to handle these materials. So he did. He came down and he told me all about the grandfather show. And um, I've been totally addicted to it ever since. So, just more um, images of the materials as they're coming in. So as I tried to wrap my head around how we were going to approach this massive project and seeing all of these materials that all 
needed some kind of attention, uh, whether it just be a light cleaning or stabilization or a more invasive treatment, um, pretty much everything needed to be stabilized so that it could safely be installed and travel. Um, and then there was the question of aesthetics and what we were going to uh, do to the objects and how we, we were going to make those decisions. And um, I needed to have a form, so <laughs> I made this form and I brought it to Glenn and I said, every object, we're going to have this form that goes with it. And um, if you just look at it, you will see it's very simple. Um, but basically, simple description of the object, the location in the installation, housing requirements, installation requirements, and then the really important thing, the current condition, and then the condition that it was in in 1974 as we can see it in the images, which we couldn't see everything, but we could see a lot. So we would look at the object, we would look at the image, and we would say either it matches or it doesn't match. And if it doesn't match, what are we going to do to make it match? So this was, this was how we wrapped our heads around this. That would be, for instance, like if an object was missing one part of the frame in 1974, but now it's missing three, it has three chips in the frame. So we would repair the two chips, but not the one that was there originally. Yes. You'll see more examples of this as well. So um, these images are just to show simple stabilization that um, we, we did to pretty much everything, it's, it seems, in some form, or at least the vast majority of the materials. So this is a photograph, and it's, if you look carefully, you can see the corners have little mens on them, and that was to repair um, holes from the previous installation and also reinforce the corners um, in case we decided to uh, use tacks again in those holes. Um, this is an image of lots of um, prints being mended. So you, if you've seen the installation, you saw the wallpaper of these fashion plates. And so a lot of these plates were damaged. Um, in this area, you can see um, a constellation of mens. And there's a mend there and a mend there. And you know, probably uh, 120 or so of these. At least. Yeah. yeah, so most of them got some kind of mend. So getting into kind of more of the aesthetics um, before and the after. And here's the image of it in the show. So is this working with the arrow? Yeah. So yeah, here, here it is in the installation. So we don't see the stain, so we remove the stain. And here it is in the installation. So pay attention to these three here in the back. So we have just some simple stabilization. And all of the framed objects um, had been not, not very well sealed. So there was a lot of dust and mold in, in all of the framed objects. So we went through and opened them all up and cleaned them and put them back together. So here is the image you just saw right here. And this is that scratch across her face. So the scratch stays. I tried to cheat on this. One. <laughs> I totally called him on it. I literally was, I was like, no, I, I, there's nothing. I think we have to fix it. And then she like looked at it and she was like, you just lied to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> he's a liar. <laughs> but now he's telling the truth, so it's OK. <laughs> um, so the before, the after, 
and um, a lot of discoloration on these. There's four that all go together, and they, they all are heavily discolored like that in the image as well. Um, so that's that one. This one, actually, we couldn't see it very well in the images, so we couldn't tell if there was that level of damage, but um, we gathered from the mold and the rust that was in the frame that it probably had been water damaged somewhat recently, and so we decided um, we would allow ourselves to do some stain reduction on that one. It's just a process image of that. And there's the after again. This one, um, there it is right there. So you can see it didn't have this um, crumbling finish. This was a really tricky finish. Um, Kelly Boss, who I'll introduce to you a little later, who is the objects conservator who is working with me and um, consulting on the show, she and I kind of went around and around of how to match this finish. It kind of looks like Formica from the 80s, but you can see the, the you know, time period is, is not the 1980s, but the 1880s. <laughs> so um, it was very confusing. We scratched our head over it, and uh, it, it just had a very odd finish. We couldn't figure out what kind of paint we would use to match that. Um, kind of put it off and put it off, and then one day uh, it came to us. And we went over to digital services and asked if they would please photograph the side of the frame that was intact so that we could make a sticker and put it on the other side of the frame. And this was a very satisfying <laughs> treatment for us because uh, in conservation, one of the main principles is that you want everything you do to be reversible. So this is sort of follows that principle very nicely. Um, so here's just an image of the tests to figure out exactly how to treat it to make it match. And that's the after of that one. This is my joy. <laughs> um, this, is, um, this is a really nice example of preserving damage. Uh, you can see this is cracked. Um, and here it is in the picture, and you can see the cracks are right in the same place. Um, it's not visible, it's not happening actually at the point that this photo was taken, but after this photo was taken, the photo started to slip out of the frame. So um, I, I had to figure out a way to get the photos to stay in the frame and also make sure that those uh, cracks and breaks don't cause any further damage. So here's some images of that treatment. So building a new mat for the photos, reinforcing the break, um, and then putting it all together in a package and um, putting it back in the frame. So um, it's pretty fun to actually you know, go through such great lengths to ensure that something stays broken. I really got, I had a lot of fun with that on this. Um, this is a really nice little travel book of the grandfathers, just a simple treatment, just met a little bit of mending, just a little bit of stabilizing that one hangs on the wall. Um, this, this is getting into what Glenn calls the show behind the show, and I call it the hidden gems. But as I was going through these framed objects, um, that I assume Etienne, or, and maybe also his wife, um, probably put these frames together, and so I would come across these really amazing uh, little treasures inside. So she was actually the back mat for him. And you can see this is a pin that's in his lapel, and there's a little rust mark 
on her chest from the pin. So all of these soldier prints had these hidden gems inside of them. But they were often hair ads or hair product ads. I mean, the, the types of things yeah. that... Um, and I think this was a sign that Etienne painted. This was, yeah, that was a hand-painted mm -hmm. sign for one of his shops. Uh, that was the back of that one. And I'll also just point out that this print is um, part of the same print. So it was cut up and put into the two frames. Just more before and after treatment shots. Some of them are very subtle. This is the, the famous hair flag that Etienne made um, after he became a Swiss citizen. He made this flag out of the hair from his barbershop floor. And did he hang it in his in his barbershop or his we, salon? We, we don't know. We we know that the mirror that he, he glued it you know to the other side of hung in his salon. Like we've we've yeah. seen that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So this is the mirror that was used. <laughs> the the frame packages are incredible. So he used a mirror for as the backboard for the frame. It's very stable. So that that's how it came to us and. A, a lot of the work we did on the frames was just replacing hardware and just making sure that everything was going to stay together for the duration of the show. This is a fun one. You can see this, the um, note at the top of the crucifix is folded in the first one and it's unfolded in the second one and I could not see in the image if it was folded or not. And I still don't really know if if Harold would want it unfolded. He, would. he, would. <laughs> he absolutely would. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure that Etienne would want it unfolded. Yeah. So I I started like my loyalties would go back and forth between between Harold Zaman and between and Etienne because I started to become very uh, I just felt very intimately acquainted with Etienne. These are perfectly pristine wallpaper samples that were in the lid of this box, are in the lid of this box, um, that were used as the padding. And th there's a lot of things like that that seem like, you know, these things were made in a time when people didn't waste things. And so you find these little pockets of just interesting materials. And I should say, some of these um, more dramatic restoration treatments on the frames, um, there's a group of conservators down in San Diego at Balboa Con Conservation Center, and we had them do some of the really dramatic restoration um, that you see. And they did a great job. So the, these are the reverse glass paintings that hang above the bed. And I just have a few examples of these treatments. So the front and the back, and then after the front and the back. I really didn't want to remove backboards if I didn't have to, but in some cases they were just too dangerous. And so I, I had to remove them. And, um, you know, so another before and after. Um, this break is definitely visible in the um, original, and it's also sort of separated like that, but it was just so unstable in that, in, in that state, and I really just couldn't, in the amount of time I had, figure out a way to stabilize it separated like that. So it's more stable, joined together, where you can still see the break, 
but everything is documented. So if at some point someone wants to do another iteration of the show and they want to separate that break, there are all these small details I that let them. I don't <laughs> seem like there's the, all these Class little details. Just are so nerve wracking. Yeah, they like are the very nerve wracking. <laughs> Yeah, we went around and around about this one because you can see this one is is really broken, um, but it also was has this really sloppy animal glue repair on it, and um, and in some ways it would be much safer for the object to redo the repair. But I just couldn't bring myself to remove that glue, knowing that Etienne or perhaps the grandmother did that repair. And it's just, it's just so charming, this, this <laughs> sloppy yellow glue all over the surface of this um, object. So, so, that's, so that's how it will stay. Um, just some quirky things to point out. I don't know if, if you all got this, but this um, landscape is actually made out of hair, and it's here in the exhibition. Um, it's a castle made out of hair. I just think it's worth noting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and another thing that I really love, another just quirky thing and that I want to point out is here you can see Etienne chipped away the frame so that you would be sure to see the title of the, of the print. So some images of the furniture. This is just cleaning. Um, and this one, the really delightful discovery of this one is I was cleaning the glass and there were these smudges that just weren't coming off and I was kind of like, hmm, that's kind of weird. And then it, the light sort of caught them and they're actually little tiny paw prints. That Chihuahua prints. Chihuahua prints. Yeah. They're around here if you want to try to spot them. Um, but I was so excited. I sent Glenn an email right away and I said, don't, don't clean you. them. I know. I said, Do don't you dare. Them. I was like, don't you dare ask me to clean them away. <laughs> but we were, we've been on the same page yeah. pretty much on everything, which has been really nice. Um, so another treatment, this is a, this is a doozy. So this is a sewing machine. You can actually see this in the footage and the video of the Fabrica and this, um, a sewing machine that had this particle board screwed onto the top, and I don't know what they were doing with it at the Fabrica. It's so Just had piles of stuff on filthy. it. Filthy. Yeah. He had his postcard collection on top of that. Oh, well, there you go. So anyway, um, this might be a nice moment to introduce Kelly Boss. Kelly, do you want to just wave to everybody? Um, Kelly. Uh, worked with me on some of the objects in the show, and uh, this was one that we worked on together. I think we probably put, like, t combined probably an absurd amount of time in cleaning this iron. At first, we thought it was corrosion and that we'd have to completely, you know, re, you know, refinish the whole thing. But as we were cleaning, just more and more and more mud kept coming off. And I thought it sort of seemed like a stuffed crust pizza, where like the, the cheese filling was just mud and it was just like pouring out of it. It just was amazing. It never, it never seemed to stop. Anyway, we did finally get it clean. And, um, the wood was also really dry and brittle, but it, anyway, it ended up looking very beautiful, and um, that was that was a fun one. So here's Kelly. Um, when I started wrapping my mind around this show, I kind of knew a I didn't have the skill set to treat a lot of these objects, and also there were just a few objects that were so important that I thought just the weight of 
the responsibility would just psych me out so much that I wouldn't be able to focus on the project as a whole. So I uh, was very happy to meet Kelly. She was a graduate intern at the, in the deck arts department at the museum at the time. And I, um, I asked her if she would come on and, and join me. So she did, and she just did an absolutely amazing job. Um, this is um, a wig, one of the wig stands under the Triumph of Beauty image. And um, do you want to talk about this yeah, a little bit? Yeah, so um, around 2000, when the Zeman family were on vacation, uh, someone broke into the Fabrica. And it was actually someone who, had, um, uh, who was staying in a... a, a sort of institution for the mentally ill and who had managed to leave without permission. And, uh, and he lived there for a week and he actually vandalized uh, a lot of the fabrica. He splashed paint, he, he was putting graffiti. Like if you're ever looking at pictures of the fabrica and you see like an anarchy symbol on the wall or like someone just wrote sex, uh, that wasn't Zeman. Uh, that was that was this this sort of 19 year old who who had broken in and uh, and the mannequin heads were were part of it and he'd actually it's drawn weird. eyes like the the one Melissa was just showing you know her eyes were supposed to be closed he had drawn these eyes on it and uh, just defaced them so yeah yes and so after after Kelly treated it this mm -hmm. is what it looked like. And she also did a lot of work on the bust. I wish I had a picture of it finished. But anyway, so this is the sort of um, the moment when you walk around the corner into the Triumph of Beauty area and there's the, the bust with the Marie Antoinette wig and the, the ship wig. So this is what she looked like when she came to us. So she already has hair underneath that wig. She does. And these are some process images as Kelly was working on her. She had a previous treatment. That's where you see the, the loss. And uh, we decided to remove that treatment because um, we thought we could do better. So this is after Kelly uh, finished the treatment. And so now it's time to choose a wig. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really sure how to go about this. So I went to a wig store. And uh, I decided, you know what, I think I should call a professional to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so um, then we meet Renee Horner. Renee, will you? give a little shout out. Um, I cannot express my happiness enough that Renee uh, found us, we found Renee. Um, she is, she's really good at what she does and she knows all about the history of wig making. She studied it in school and it was really fun to work with her and she just had this huge wealth of knowledge on the history of hairstyling and it was so satisfying because she would know things that there's no way Glenn or I could know but we knew that Etienne would have known those things so it was just really fun to have her kind of just share little details about why the wig was styled the way it was styled or you know what that might have meant so before we saw the color footage, did you talk about the color footage mm -hmm. yet? Yeah. So before we saw the color footage, we didn't know what color her hair was, so we were going with just this sort of traditional white, but then we saw in the footage that it was actually blonde, so Renee made all of these blonde samples for us to choose from. So here's an image of um, the first fitting at the GRI. She's looking good. She's come a long way. She's come, she yeah. has. And this is as I'm preparing to build a mount for her. Here she is on her mount. And now we're at the ICA. And she's going in for her hairstyling. 
and installed. These last images are of textiles. We also had the pleasure of working with a really great textile conservator who has worked extensively with costumes. Um, she did a lot of treatments for the dresses from Gone with the Wind and costumes from The Wizard of Oz. Her name is Kara Varnell. And it was really fantastic working with her. Um, she did a lot of work on not only stabilizing the garments, because they are extremely fragile. Um, I think they're the most fragile things in the show. Yeah, it's scary to pick yeah. them up. Yeah. They're very brittle. Um, so she, she did a lot of work just stabilizing them and um, building these sort of custom hangers for them so that we can, when we travel the show, we can just kind of keep them on the hanger stabilized put them in the box, kind of take them out and put them back up and they'll, um, yeah, the, the weight is distributed in such a way that there's not too much strain on the garments. So I think this is back to you, right? Okay. I'm going to check. I'm going to do a time check. Okay. Are we doing okay? We're good. So I guess now we're going to talk with the other side of um, finding things and making things, mostly making things. Uh, I'm not going to talk as much about the finding. It would have been this long talk about eBay and Etsy and all of the uh, individual country, Germany, uh, Switzerland, Austria, um, Hungary, their auction sites um, and websites like voistflowmarkt.ch, which I would use whenever I was in Switzerland to find out what flea market is happening today uh, to find things. But we're going to focus more on, on kind of fabrication. Um, so the biggest piece is missing. Um, we had, if, if, if you guys can picture the bedroom right now, uh, we had many of the pieces of furniture. We had the, the round table. We had the writing table. We had the display cabinet. We had one of two matching wardrobes. We had the vanity. Uh, the only furniture we were missing was basically everything in this picture. Uh, so the, the two beds, which are the centerpiece, the two side tables, and then the, the one wardrobe. The fact that it's a matching set made it a nightmare. Um, you know, the easiest thing would really be to just make everything new, because then you, you can guarantee that, that it matched. Um, working on this part was, was uh, really a collaboration with Beatrice Curti, who sadly could not be here tonight, but she's an art director who works in Hollywood, uh, and she uh, sort of spearheaded this effort, and then also it was her network and connections that brought in all of her other um, scenic artists and fabricators, and so Beatrice played a really huge part in just knowing how to do these things, uh, starting with you know, making uh, building diagrams. I mean, we had a furniture maker uh, that took this this job on, but uh, making these diagrams of sort of what we're what we're trying to do um, here, and then uh, you know that furniture maker fabricated the pieces, um, and then put a put a veneer on that would be the right sort of grain, uh, but not trying to do an exact match because we knew. Uh, uh, there was going to be another step that did that. And then just, just to note a couple things, you know, part of an, an added challenge, all this stuff has to travel for a year and a half to Europe, and so what things weigh really matters, uh, how large things are really matters, and so air beds needed to be collapsible. Uh, this second, this, this wardrobe, it actually doesn't open. Uh, you can get into it from the back. So if we want, we can actually use this as a sort of crate. Uh, so when the show travels, we might be packing some of the things inside of it. Uh, because again, we have to think about those things too, about how are these things going to ship? Um, how are we going to pack them up? So here, here's the piece sort of um, delivered. Uh, and then uh, at this point, we were working with uh, Portia Perry Schaefer. I don't know if Portia's here tonight. She had talked about coming. Portia, are you here? 
Uh, well, if she were, I'd ask her to wave and seeing her endless praises. Um, here she is sort of starting to work. So, so basically, we pulled out the original pieces and then she would sort of look at them and, and uh, judge their color and then try to get the, the finish to match. So here we are working on part of it uh, at, at uh, a Getty site. Um, here they are sort of in, in process. And she also, uh, you know, was, was sort of aging the, the, um, the handles and the knobs and things like that, sort of adding patina to them, getting them all to match. And then the, the final bits had to happen at the ICA, so we sort of moved it in. Because you change the light, the colors change. Um, so the, the final bits have to kind of be tuned to sort of what the lighting is, is going to be like. So we have it in the space and then we're kind of doing the final bits until it matches. So, you know, here these are original pieces, these are the fake pieces, um, but they match very, very well. Um, while we're on the subject of the beds, um, you know, so many of these walls, we really would have most of the pieces or only a few things missing. And it just had to be that this was the wall where we were missing the most things. Uh, with, with their worst culprit being this big painting. And you know, when you're trying to substitute prints, there's a whole way to do that because prints are multiple and prints are numerous and prints are cheap um, and prints are available. Paintings are just another story, and because also remember, uh, things have to be the right size. You see how tightly these things are hung. You can't just change the size of something without throwing the whole thing off. Um, and then color is so so important in in this show. You know, it, it's a Virgin and Child with Saint Anne. It's a sort of popular theme, but um, you know, what were we going to do? Um, I started sort of dropping in color images of what we had uh, so I could see how the colors sort of worked together. And then as I started looking for prints to buy, I would drop them into and sort of see, okay, because it's not only finding something the right size and the right shape and the right subject and the right time period, but also is going to match everything else. So we'd sort of start playing with that. Uh, and then finally with that painting, it's like, well, I can't find a painting like that. But there are other virgin and children with, with St. Anne that are copied more often. So maybe I could find an old painting that's copying these other uh, sort of better known paintings. Um, this one worked the best, but, but basically none of them worked. Uh, it's just you need sort of the thing itself. So one of our tasks was sort of making that painting and making that frame. And this is the very best image we have of it. Here it is. You can sort of see what's there, but then if you're asking someone to copy it, um, there's not a lot of detail. Um, ultimately, Beatrice, she, she had it printed on canvas, so that in a way the, the sort of you know, uh, the equivalent of a sketch was there. We did the sort of photo transfer to canvas. Uh, and then uh, an, an artist, a scenic artist, um, well, much more than a scenic artist, but, but an artist who agreed to sort of help us, Kitty Doris Bates, um, in very, very limited free time, um, sort of did this. Uh, and when I first saw it, I thought, okay, it's over, we failed. Uh, there's just no way, but, but uh, you know, we tried so hard and it's like, we're gonna have this hanging over the bed and what the hell am I gonna do? I mean, it's like, so much of this pro project was just me walking around wondering what the hell am I gonna do? Um, <laughs> but, but then, you know, th this, this wasn't finished. Uh, this, this is sort of, this is basically your canvas for then um, the, the aging process in Hollywood. So Kitty turned it over to Portia uh, and, and Portia sort of overpainted a little bit. She added a crackle coat. She sort of added a lacquer coat. She sort of yellowed it properly. And so now we're looking better. Uh, and then Don Francis Framing, who's making a lot of custom frames for us, you know, they sort of, working from pictures, made uh, this frame to match. And now it's looking even better. And we're in bright sunlight here. Uh, so then once you get it, uh, over the beds, uh, it fits in actually pretty well. Uh, no one really notices, and I think we did a pretty good job, actually. Um, but you never know. There's so much just, um, you know, leaps of faith, I guess. Um, 
other examples, of, of, we have a lot of facsimiles in, in the exhibition or, or things that we've needed to resize or alter in one way and uh, working with the, the genius of Joby Benjamin at the Getty. And Joby is here sitting at the back. There's Joby. Uh, I could talk for an hour just about the things that Joby did, but, but just, to sh just to show a couple of, of examples um, where a lot of times Joby's work, it, 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 again, it's the sort of chain of doing things. So here on this wall, um, we were missing this amazing object sort of at the bottom, uh, which was this sort of call for people to give donations to um, Austrian and Hungarian men living in Bern who've been called away to fight in World War I and left their wives and children behind and sort of give donations for them. And we don't have it. Uh, it's, and there's no way to get it. I mean, it's, you know, it's something, Etienne had been one of the people that made this. Um, but we had a pretty good image of it. And again, Kitty Doris Bates copied it. So she did this sort of as calligraphy. Uh, she was working on a film in New Orleans at the time, so she FedExed this to us. Um, Joby then sort of photographed it and color corrected it. And then we realized we were sort of speculating about the colors, but I'd, I'd, I hadn't given her all the right words to make red. Uh, so Joby could fix that, you can see, to sort of get that right. And then I don't have a great process pick here, but then uh, Joby printed that out, and then Portia artificially aged it. Uh, and then we got a mat for it, which we also artificially aged, and then Kevin Young at the Getty uh, made a frame to look the same. So here it is uh, looking in a, in a sort of, you know, fake aged mat and in a frame sort of matching. So and we had, and this is just, this, this process here is a stand-in for a dozen cases where we had to do something like that. I mean, that was, that was sort of very common. Uh, or here's another case. These prints above the window here we don't have them, and I don't know what they are, um, except we could tell that they're domestic scenes, and we can tell that they all have a printer's mark in the corner. Uh, and beyond that, uh, there's just no way to know what they were part of a set. And so I started going through and, and just finding in the Getty collection books that we had already digitized and that had kind of domestic prints. And then Joby would, would resize them um, and sort of make them look more like this, and sort of going in here, this is the best image on earth of that printer's mark. Here, the best image on earth of that printer's mark. There it is. Uh, and, and Joby sort of extrapolated uh, into this and was able to add it in. Um, but then we still had these very new looking prints, so then they're handed over to Portia, uh, and Portia sort of ages them, uh, and sort of here they are. Uh, in the installation. Or other cases, you know, this, this costume print here, we didn't have it. I found this on eBay. Great. Uh, it was too big. I knew we'd have to, that, that Joby would have to sort of resize it and, and take the text out. But, you know, this, this should be a pretty easy one. Uh, then remember that color footage uh, that we found uh, right before Thanksgiving? Remember that the information is always in the margins. It wasn't red. It was, it was green. Um, and so Joby could change that also. Um, and so here's the sort of finished print, and it looks fabulous, and it's, it's the right color. Um, the fireplace. Um, you know, it, it, at a certain point, if we're going to go full illusion, like, let's go full illusion, so we need to make a fireplace. Um, you know, here's, here's the original um, work. You know, this show after LA is, is going to be installed in the original apartment in Bern, and the, the tenants there are moving out for three months. And so a lot of the process, you know, they let us come in and measure the apartment with a laser and took endless photographs you know, for us of what, like, their curtain uh, tracks look like and, and other little details. And so they, you know, we, we, we could get better images of the fireplace and to get a sense of the color. And then uh, we found this, which, you know, it, it's really not bad. It's close in size uh, and it's fake. Um, it actually was used in some heavy metal video, but I forget which one. 
Um, but it's, it, and when it comes to shipping, uh, you know, it, it would work pretty well. And then Beatrice kind of designed a fireplace insert uh, made out of styrofoam, which another prop house uh, sort of fabricated the styrofoam. And then there were endless rounds of, of Porsche painting and making it ashy, making it less ashy. Um, you know, and here it is sort of in the final. And then that stone at the bottom, that's just a sticker on some particle board. Um, it looks really good. Um, everybody's favorite, the Chihuahua. Um, you know, uh, Leontine Zeman had two beloved Chihuahuas. She carried one of them around with her at all times. I think before that was fashionable. Um, uh, and then had it taxidermied. This is, I, this is not really anatomically, I think taxidermy's come a long way, let's say. Um, but um, we, didn't, we, didn't have, we didn't have this, but we have to have it. I mean, how can you do, how can you do the show uh, without, there's no possible way. So, you know, it, it starts with, we have to find a chihuahua. And they're out there. They are out there. It was a Victorian thing. Look at this little guy. Look at this one. Look at this one. Um, a lot of them are in bell jars. Um, this one's found a turtle. Do you see? Uh, these, these things um, sell for like $15,000 or more. You know, uh, one of those that I what had sold for like thirty thousand dollars. I mean, the, the sort of real Victorian era uh, taxidermy, uh, and and it's and it's not sold in the U.S. And anything I was finding for sale was happening like in in London. And um, but we had this amazing image, um, and so and then we were blessed to find um, at Alice Markham from Prey Taxidermy. And I don't know if Alice is here. I don't. Uh, so Alice, you know, I think was, was very innovative. Uh, she was able to take this kind of photo shoot of the Chihuahua uh, and begin to make a 3D model, uh, sort of using the photograph as a model. Uh, so she could actually to make, make, a, make a form. So the pose would be the right way. Uh, and then she 3D printed it. And so that was the taxidermy form. Uh, that she started working with, and then she she sourced the right, the almost exact right harness and aged it. She made the bow and aged it. Uh, here, I mean, it's just my heart melts. Um, and and you know, and put it on the the sort of this old style of of, of base that you would use for um, a Chihuahua. So, um, and it's it's wonderful to kind of, you know, it's it's great that. There are so many like innovative and skilled people out there, and it's great to be in Los Angeles, which is a city where things like this can happen. And to me, it, it was in a way, it, it's, it, it was in a way what Los Angeles can bring to something like this exhibition. That you know, this is this is its home now. This is where we're going to introduce the show. Let's take advantage of what's around us and do things here that you you know you couldn't really do in in another city, really. Um, just. The labels, my God, you probably haven't thought about the labels. Uh, there are 44 labels just on this one wall. Um, they're small, they're discreet, um, you know, uh, but, but Zeman did save them. Um, and, and again, you know, things are so tight, you can't really make them larger, you can't change the font size, uh, but, but we have them. And so we were able to get them translated and sort of source the font, Richard Massey, uh, worked on designing these for us, and um, and then to get into some of like the little, there are a lot of little subliminal things that are in this show, and, and the, here's here's one of them. Uh, sort of looking at the labels, we realized Zaman had some ticks, uh, or his typewriter did, and there's certain keys that that he just tended to hit harder, uh, and we realized that if we did that in the English, and we sort of weighted the W's a little more, or uh, we just picked some of the letters that he always weighted more. Uh, then, we, then when we produce the labels, they don't look printed anymore. They look like they were typewritten. Uh, and, so, and so Richard was going through by hand and sort of adding more weight uh, to these digital files. And then we were able, since we had the original labels, we could match the paper and weight. And um, it, has, it has the same feeling, uh, but then it's in English. 
Um, and so when the show travels to Switzerland and Germany, we'll use the original German labels and then we'll produce these all over again in Italian when it um, goes to Italy. Um, okay, the thumbtacks. Um, I'm surprised that we're devoting the whole section to the thumbtacks. <laughs> I just see how traumatizing it was for you now. <laughs> I think we, we spent as much time, um, more debate about thumbtacks than has probably ever been had for a show because it, because it no, no, but this goes, this goes to the heart actually of what this project is about because it, it, when in deciding the color of the thumbtacks, you're getting into a question of are we trying to make this show look the way that it looked in 1974, or are we trying to do a show with the 1974 objects today? Um, because we, we have some of the original thumbtacks and they turned yellow. And so the question is, do we try to get yellowed thumb, thumbtacks or do we try to yellow thumbtack? And there are 2,000 thumbtacks in this show. So, I mean, it, it's a big, thumbtacks are pervasive. These little polka dots are coding this show. Uh, and, and so, you know, do you, and, and I listened to this podcast where a, a, a scenic artist was talking about how even when you're doing historical dramas, uh, they make things look aged because the mind still thinks it's in the past, so they think things should look old, even though they look new then. And that, like, maybe had too much of an effect on me. But, um, so here we are, we're buying every thumbtack there is, and we're doing color tests, and, and uh, you know, what we learn here is the Zeman thumbtack down here, so you can see how it's yellowed. And what we learn, and you, you really see it when you put them all together, thumbtacks today either skew blue or they skew pink. Uh, they look white when they're individually there, but when you put them all together, everything either skews a little blue or a little pink. Uh, we ultimately found one that, that looked white, uh, but that's only the first problem because the other problem is these are now Getty collection objects. You can't just thumbtack them to the wall. Uh, you know, we, we had to come up with another way. So that's where Melissa comes in. Um, unless the thing is a prop, uh, all those thumbtacks you see in there are fronts for magnets. Uh, and, and there's actually, uh, here we are sort of doing tests. Uh, here we are <laughs> making, um, we sort of had a party where uh, we sort of were clipping the, the heads off of all of these. And so here we have, this is Richard Massey, uh, Doris Chan and Pietro Rigolo, who are also uh, curators on the show. Um, Audrey Young, who I was mentioning earlier, um, there's me. Um, so that was a, a big effort. Um, and then just quickly to say, because it, it, um, the money wall uh, is, of course, where hundreds of the thumbtacks are, but uh, this was another, I mean, it's one little part of the show, but it was such a huge effort to, oh my God, map this money against like the one little picture and to sort of figure out, again, from kind of shapes where everything went. And I think we did a pretty good job of um, ultimately mapping it out. Uh, for when we were hanging it. Here you can see, like, this is what's actually going on with the thumbtack. So there's, there'll be like a little metal, like a nail head or screw, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that's really all we have to say, except here's some pictures from the opening uh, that we found that um, Katarina Sieverdine, who was there, had sort of taken. And uh, it's sort of interesting to see people in the show back then. Um, but. Yeah, so Melissa, I don't know if you had more to add or if we want to let people ask questions. Yeah, maybe let's open it up for questions. Mm -hmm. I know one of you has a question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, you brought this archive back to life, and um, my question was, what, what would the idea of the living archive be for you, having gone through this process? Of the living, yeah, uh, that's a tough question. Um, you know, I, I sort of use the phrase when I, um, 
first started talking about this show and then first started, you know, s trying to build support uh, for the idea of doing this show, which was a sort of years long process, I, I used the phrase summon it back into being, that uh, we have the components of this show and it's within our power to summon it back into being. And, and the Getty in this unique way is, to my mind, perhaps the only institution in the world that has the infrastructure and the sort of inherent staff expertise and the resources and the ability uh, to make this happen. And if we're going, you, you know, something like the Zeman Archive, which, um, you know, the, you, I, I could name a lot of reasons why the Zeman Archive, you know, could have maybe should have stayed in Europe than coming here. So if it is going to come here, then we have an even greater responsibility to show why that matters. Uh, and it's, it, it is incumbent upon us if, if we, the further away we take something from its home, then the greater investment we need to make into, um, you know, making it have a good home here. I mean, I, I think that's, that's part of the curatorial responsibility in a way. Uh, but also, uh, if, if you're going to have an archive like the Harold Zaman archive, and what better thing to have in that archive than a Harold Zaman exhibition? Uh, you know, and how, how that's absolutely rare. Uh, it's, it's sort of unprecedented. And then on top of that, to realize that this was an immensely important exhibition for him. He wrote about it almost as much as his other major shows. He talked about it constantly. He saw it as, as his great learning experience, and he never curated a show the same way after. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's, it's not just a show of old wigs. Uh, this, this was a turning point in the history of curating, in, in my opinion. Uh, and so um, how can we not do it? Uh, and, that's, and, and to me, it, it makes a demonstration of why archives matter and what you can do with them and how they themselves are a, a sort of creative medium. Certainly, Zeman saw, that that, saw them that way. So I don't know if that's quite answering your question, but it's, you know. Yeah, it's not, it's uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, it, it, it became in a way a prototype for him for, for how he approached some later shows. And, you know, th there was, I mean, a lot of the things that are in this show he had done before. I mean, he had shown non-art before. He had done, uh, you know, like his science fiction show, for, for instance, which included popular culture, or he had, he had shown sort of folk art. He maybe had rarely mixed all those media together so freely before. Um, but, but for me, you know, when you're standing in the, the last room of the exhibition, the smallest room and the most crowded room, with all of the beauty tools and all of these domestic objects, and uh, you know, what you see there, you are surrounded by the visual culture that produced Dada and Surrealism in the early 20th centuries. And of course, Zeman's next show after Grandfather was The Bachelor Machines, where he's looking at this, at this turn in the early 20th century towards this different type of avant-garde that is looking back to this machine aesthetic and is uh, approaching logic and, and creativity in a different way. And you see these references put in there. So, you know, in that last room, we have the coffee grinder. We had, you know, we have these sort of images. We have these kind of Duchampian like ready-mades that are in there already. We have these, these surrealist heads. Uh, you know, there are all of these references to that modernism. Uh, that, and that is pure Harold Zeman. It's Etienne's things, but, but making this constellation that then pushes your mind into the avant-garde of the early 20th century, that is where Harold Zeman is taking us. And that's where he took us next. 
uh, you know, he then spent the next 10 years of his life working on this trilogy of exhibitions that revised uh, our, our, the way you can tell the story of modernism. Uh, so so that's, that's how I would sort of place that um, in, in the, the context of what, what it did to him as a curator, what it means for how you can approach a, a topic as a curator. Yeah, um, you already sorry, you already answered a little bit to me to what I was going to ask. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I was uh, going to ask you what you learned about Harald Zeman doing the exhibition. Mm -hmm. the most. Melissa, I wonder if you have an answer to that because, in a way, you were so deeply with some of the individual objects, and, and yeah. were there cases where uh, an object just spoke to you in a new way after you'd really spent a long time touching it? <laughs> um, I think I was, for me, it was kind of all about the, the hair. It was sort of everywhere, you know, it was in the images and um, obviously the whole section on the triumph of beauty, but just this like very kind of visceral um, material that was being used throughout the show and kind of just the, the moment of the, um, the tools kind of next to the, the bust and this kind of torture beauty juxtaposition that is happening in that area of the, of the show was something that I kind of kept coming around to um, over and over again, and and the other thing was the this kind of mixing of the personal and the professional, and how um, you know Harold Zaman made this exhibition about something that was so intimate to him, and um, but like Glenn is saying, he's you know engaging with these bigger conversations that are going on in the art world at the time. Um, and also just bringing in these questions of what is an artist is, you know, Etienne is a hairstylist, but he's also an artist. Zaymon is a curator, but he's also an artist. And um, just kind of at every turn questioning these um, assumptions of, of what, you know, what constitutes an artwork. Um, I, I think that's kind of where, that's kind of where I've taken it, and it's it's something that I just, I like I'm just constantly making new discoveries as I as I look at different things. For me, I think um, there there were two things for me. One is discovering what a formalist uh, that he was, and realizing, you know, when you first look at, at this show, and when you first look at a lot of other Zeman shows, especially the later shows, your first impression is a sort of chaos. Um, but there was this huge order underneath um, and, and that goes really deep in a way. So like if, if we're looking at, at this image here, I mean obviously we see a sort of symmetry that's here. Uh, but what I didn't realize in, until I started trying to drop in substitute images, um, you see for instance, like here we have this oval object and so the object underneath it has an oval composition even though uh, it's not, you know, here it's a rectangular object and there's a rectangular composition underneath it. And so he's always, uh, and, and once I started seeing that, you, you start seeing it more and more and in his later shows, uh, there's always, he always starts with an inherent symmetry and geometry that he does as a base and then starts uh, hiding that a little bit. And uh, it's now, now I can look at any Zeman show and kind of see it. Um, and so that there is this, he had a sort of innate system of how you can do a wall uh, that I had never realized before. Um, and it's a great trick um, for curators. So I'm like happy to have kind of learned it. Um, and then the other thing I would say is just that um, family, however you define it, um, is such a theme that goes through his work. 
Um, and it doesn't have to be family by blood. It can be the family you make uh, or, or the family um, of artists that surround you or what have you. But that, that runs so deep in his work and was driving a, a lot of the things that he did. And I hadn't necessarily thought of him in, in those terms either. At the back. So I kind of have two thoughts and you can kind of jump on whichever one seems interesting. Um, one is kind of the thought of um, what decisions were made, or if you know which decisions were made by the grandfather and which decisions were made by Harold in terms of like the installation of the materials. Mm -hmm. Like you're kind of pointing to the fact that maybe he made some of those kinds of decisions, but um, also kind of wondering how much he was copying. And actually this kind of leads into my second thought, which is this kind of like um, idea of like fetish like fetishization of the things, like mm -hmm. that, you know, like what the grandfather was doing that to his own things, and then uh, Harold was doing it to his things, mm -hmm. and then we're doing it to his things, mm -hmm. and like all this kind of layering of all yeah. of that, which just yeah. seems kind of get you get more and more refined, you know, of like what we're defining and what, you know, I don't know. So, anyway. Yeah. I, I can actually answer that, the first part of that question, pretty definitively. Um, because if, if something is in an antique frame, then it was framed the way Etienne wanted it to be. Uh, and if something is in either uh, an aluminum frame or a, a sort of plain blonde wood frame, then Zeman had it framed for the show. Um, so, uh, and by the time this, uh, Etienne died in 1970. Uh, so he, he wasn't around when the show was happening. And so the, the main influence that Etienne uh, had on the show beyond sort of having these objects to begin with would be how they were framed. And of course the frames are kind of amazing. Uh, you know, the, the frames themselves are, are so interesting. Um, we have some pictures of Etienne's apartment. And so we, we know with certainty that it looked absolutely nothing the, like the way Zeman hung these things. Uh, in, in no instance, really, was, was Zeman copying one of Etienne's arrangements or something like that. I think the house was, was quite full, uh, but just in a very different way. Uh, and so any arrangement that you see here was very intentionally Harold Zeman and, and was his narrative that he was putting on top. The, the grandfather and grandmother, they lived with these objects in a completely different way. And in terms of, of the, the fetishizing, um, we sure are. Uh, you know, I mean, we can, we can start with It's the with hair. <laughs> Uh, but you, you know, and, and that is, it, it is an aspect of the show, um, you know, and, and you can hear Zeman in, in a way answer that question in the Swiss TV footage that's over there because he talks about how, uh, you know, the scissors in the show are simultaneously very special scissors because they're in the show, but they're also, they're just scissors like any other but they're also special scissors because they're in the show and you're always gonna be going back and forth, you know, between that. And, uh, and he also, you know, in his writing, he talks about, for instance, that, uh, you know, visiting the historic home of Beethoven, uh, that you can learn more from, more about Beethoven by seeing his ear trumpets than by anything you might read. And so that there is in some way this power of an artifact uh, to communicate. Uh, of course, we say that about art, um, without saying that we're fetishizing it, which of course we are. Um, but, you know, it, any, any object, I mean, th this, this is what, I mean, this is what this profession is about. Uh, you put it inside that gallery and suddenly every decision can have meaning, uh, whether you want it to or not. I mean, th this is what this show is about. What happens when you start to arrange things in space to produce meaning? Um, how are you changing? Uh, one's, one's interpretive framework by doing that. Um, I mean, that's, that's going to the essence of, of what curating as a profession is. That's, that's, that's you know, this, this our project uh, to reconstruct this exhibition, I see it as my love letter to my profession. 
um, you know, because it's, it's, it, it, it's getting to the heart of, of why we do this, what we're doing here. Uh, and it's, it's, it's laying that bare in a way uh, without the trappings of art around it, uh, with sort of extraordinary objects, but also everyday extraordinary objects. Uh, and so that's, it, 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 in a way, that's, that's what drew it to me, because you don't have the, um, uh, these other external art factors, um, you know, um, clouding over uh, what else is at stake when you, when you do an exhibition to begin with. I think it's time to thank you for coming. Uh, thank you.